ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's my privilege to welcome you to another great conversation on religion and democracy, hosted by Yeshiva University's Zahava and Moshel Strauss Center for Torah and Western Thought. Can everyone hear me? Excellent. I want to recognize and welcome Zahava and Moshel Strauss, our partners in the vision that is the Strauss Center. I'm pleased as well to welcome you to the magnificent sanctuary of Sherith Israel, my synagogue. And I want to recognize our Parnas, Louis Solomon, who is joining us here this evening. I thank the Strauss Center's assistant director, Stu Halpern, for all that he did for tonight's event and for all our programs. And I want to thank as well my colleague, Alan Sector. This evening is part of the culmination of our years, year-long programming on Zionism, begun in commemoration of the 100th birthday of Menachem Begin. And so we're delighted to announce the publication of the book emerging from our conference on Begin, a book titled Menachem Begin's Zionist Legacy. And I want to thank Dave Schimmel and David Werber, who sponsored the volume of essays that emerged from our major academic conference on Begin. And I want to recognize the extraordinary editor of the volume, Neil Kazadoy of the Tikva Fund, editor as well of the incredible online magazine Mosaic, which has produced the book. Tonight's event is sponsored by Joshua and Bryna Landis and their children in memory of their father and grandfather, Rabbi Aaron Landis, who served with great distinction as a Navy chaplain in the United States Armed Forces and as the longtime senior rabbi of Beth Shalom Congregation in Elkins Park, Pennsylvania. Rabbi Landis achieved the rank of Rear Admiral as a chaplain in the Naval Reserve. And I just note that Josh has previously honored his father's service by memorializing another great Jewish naval officer, Uriah Phillips Levy, who was a member of this synagogue and so special to all of us at Cherith Israel and to the history of Jews in America at large. It was Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik who once said that Jews have a unitive approach to time, by which he means that stories that occurred to our people long ago can be ex actually experienced in the here and now, or as he put it, bygones for Jews turn into facts, pale memories into living experiences, and archeological history into a vibrant reality. In one week on Purim, we will read from the book of Esther, and we do not need to use our imagination all that much to connect to the present, the story that it tells, a story in which a tyrannical government in Persia declares its desire to see the Jewish people wiped out, where the fate of freedom hangs by a thread and the decision made by a few individuals can decide the destiny of millions. Today, we have Iran on the brink of becoming a nuclear power, anti-Semitism resurgent not only in the Middle East but throughout Europe. We have a world in disarray and we have what all sides of the political divide would call the worst relationship between an American president and an Israeli prime minister that we can find in recent memory. So, to help prepare us to celebrate this holiday by discussing this cheerful state of affairs, we have two of the most gifted writers of foreign policy of our age both authors of incredibly important books. Brett Stevens writes Global View, the Wall Street Journal's foreign affairs column, for which he won the Pulitzer Prize for commentary in 2013. He is a member of the journal's editorial board and is now the author of America in Retreat, The New Isolationism and the Coming Global Disorder. Joshua Moravchik, currently a fellow at the Foreign Policy Institute of the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, is a human rights expert, author of numerous books, and now the author of Making David into Goliath, How the World Turned Against Israel. Both books are available immediately following our event, and today we will be having a discussion whose subject draws both books together. Our topic is... America, Israel, and the future of the free world. Please join me in welcoming our guests. Let's just begin with a broad question that addresses our theme. Uh, Brett, uh, toward the beginning of your book, you state your essential thesis, which is that 
whatever we do, we need to understand that American preeminence is not going anywhere. We will remain the world's leading power for decades to come. America is not in decline. Rather, you write, it is retreat. It, it is in retreat. Josh, at the end of your book, you stress the importance of American support for Israel, and you argue that the state of Israel is dependent on America for, in your words, absolutely everything in the realms of diplomacy, security, and even economically. And so our first question is, how dominant and unchallenged a power is America today in the world? How dependent is Israel on America? And how much does the breakdown between American and Israeli administrations truly imperil Israel right now? All right, start is this with, on? Start with Brett Stevens on my right. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for, for receiving me here and thank you for coming out on such a cold evening to, uh, uh, to, listen, us, to, to listen to us talk about such depressing uh, uh, topics. Brings down the temperature even, um, even further. Everybody, can everybody hear? I want to make sure everybody hears. Can yeah. everyone hear me? I don't know if I can hear myself. Um, look, in the past six years under this administration, the United States has very consciously pursued a policy of shrinking its footprint. Uh, you know, there's an environmental slogan, reduce, reuse, recycle. And the slogan of the Obama administration could be something like uh, rebalance, retrench, retreat. Uh, so the dominance that we enjoyed 20 years ago or 10 years ago is not the same that we enjoy today. Not because we don't have power, not because our economy is, is um, uh, uh, handicapped or because we can't exercise power if we would like to do so, but because we have declared to countries like Russia, China, Syria, Iran, that we are no longer eager to fulfill functions we once fulfilled as being essentially the world's policemen. And this has created a series of power vacuums around the world. Lo and behold, we're slowly coming to grips with the fact that when you create a power vacuum in Syria, in northern Iraq, in the South China Sea, in Central or Eastern Europe, it isn't miraculously filled by um, uh, humanitarian NGO workers doing, uh, performing good deeds. It's filled by Vladimir Putin. It's filled by ISIS. It's, it's filled by uh, Khamenei and the Al-Quds uh, Al Force. And so this, is, this has created a situation in which crises are emerging around, uh, around the world. That is directly connected to our unwillingness to engage with those crises. At the same time, it's difficult to see how any country has the will or, or has at least the wherewithal and perhaps eventually the will to deal with those crises. We are not going to defeat ISIS by relying on the air power of the United Arab Emirates. We are not going to thwart Vladimir Putin by relying on the diplomacy of Angela Merkel and Francois Hollande. I mean, the view that America is the indispensable country remains absolutely, uh, absolutely correct. However, However, that being said, it is the case that countries that formerly relied on us for security guarantees, and it's not just Israel, it's Poland, it's South Korea, it's the Philippines, uh, it's Japan, uh, now have to start, or Saudi Arabia, now have to start rethinking uh, their um, security outlook. I think the first country in the Middle East that will detonate a nuclear weapon, it test a nuclear weapon, isn't going to be Iran. I think it's going to be Saudi Arabia. They are not going to sit still. They are not going to wait on, uh, on events. And a country like Israel will now have to rethink the easy and I think incredibly lazy assumption that it had these past few years that in the end the Obama administration will interfere in a serious or intervene in a serious way, act in a serious way, to stop Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. Not only are we not stopping Iran from getting a nuclear weapon, but this diplomacy means we are facilitating Iran's acquisition of nuclear weaponry. Well, I, I, I agree uh, substantially with, uh, uh, with uh, 
the points that Brett just made. The, the, the fact is that the United States uh, retains a tremendous amount of uh, capability to exercise power, uh, and arguably even more than in the past. If we uh, cast our minds back to the 1970s, uh, President Nixon and, uh, and Secretary Kissinger had this theory that they put forward that the world was uh, shifting to a uh, five-cornered balance of power, the U.S., the USSR, China, Europe, and Japan. The USSR is gone. Europe is in disarray uh, and, and shows no signs of, of being a powerful actor on the international stage. Japan is in you know, a permanent state of uh, recession and, and, uh, and China, uh, who knows? So I, I think Brett is exactly right in saying that America's uh, power as potential uh, has not uh, diminished in any serious way. Uh, but we have been uh, governed by a president who I think came to office with a, a theory that most of the problems that we faced in the world were of our own making by being too disrespectful, too belligerent, too uh, eager to stick our noses in and, and to other people's problems and that if we disciplined ourselves then things would unfold in a much more happy way uh, around the world. I, I think that thesis has been put to the test and uh, more or less everyone except for President Obama has uh, taken on board what the, re what the results of, of uh, this test have been. Uh, I think that um, uh, all of the uh, damage that is being done uh, is reversible under a different uh, U.S. administration it won't be reversible without pain and, uh, and real, real effort, uh, but it is reversible with the exception that if, in fact, uh, uh, Obama plays the role of, kind of ushering Iran into the status of being a nuclear weapons power, uh, that will be uh, probably irreversible and uh, uh, leave Israel as well as uh, the whole Middle East region and the United States itself in a in a compromised position. Just very briefly, I mean, uh, I think what what Josh said is very well stated. Uh, the, the U.S. had two um, isolationist uh, moments in the 20th century. One was the period after the First World War, which was a period that lasted 20 years when the United States, along with Britain and France, the great liberal democracies and the victors of the First World War, decided for reasons of their own that they weren't interested in policing uh, the world order they had created. And so suddenly, uh, the so-called revisionist regimes, Germany, the Soviet Union, then Italy and Japan, realized it was open season, realized that there were no consequences to misbehavior. So you have, in 1929, Japan signing the Kellogg-Briand Pact, outlawing war forever, and the next year it invaded Manchuria. It took the League of Nations a year to determine that Japan had, in fact, invaded Manchuria. Not surprisingly, four years after that, five years after that, Italy invades Abyssinia. Uh, a year later, Germany retakes the Rhineland, then the Sudeten crisis, and, and so forth and so on. So that was a 20-year period of isolationism which created the catastrophe of the Second World War. The second period was after the Vietnam War where there was a moment where essentially the policy view uh, was largely the same. It was come home America. It was, the, you know, it was the idea that the country that most needed to be contained wasn't the Soviet Union, it was uh, the United States itself. So the question that I think confronts us now is whether the current mood of isolationism and withdrawal is going to follow that brief five-year, six-year pattern of the late 1970s, followed by a very different policy, or have we entered the same, or are we repeating the pattern and the mistakes of the interwar years? So let's build on this then by addressing something that both of you referred to, and that is Iran, and let's just address first Prime Minister Netanyahu's visit to America next week, 
and his uh, coming address to the joint session. Uh, one of the concerns of your book, uh, Josh, is the central concern is how much of the West has lost its former admiration for Israel, a state that, based on all the standard concerns of a liberal democracy, should be the something a source of great admiration. Um, in your recent column, Brett, arguing for the Prime Minister to go ahead with his speech, you wrote that Israel cannot expect indefinite support from the U.S. if it acts like an obedient client to a cavalier American patron. The margin of Israel's security is measured not by anyone's love, but by the respect of friends and enemies alike. So how important is it for Israel to design its policies to increase the chances of it being admired versus it being respected? And how should that impact Netanyahu's decision as to how he acts and what he says in the next week? Well, I, there's much about that Israel does that's, uh, uh, that, that's worthy of respect and much that's worthy of admiration. And uh, I, I don't know that Israel need, ought, ought to go about seeking uh, more things to do that will uh, uh, that will uh, win either the question is that uh, uh, that uh, Israel the, the whole world is going to suffer greatly if Iran becomes a nuclear weapons power uh, but uh, Israel is uh, near the center of the target with the uh, uh, repeated statements by Iranian officials of their uh, desire to uh, wipe Israel off the map and also what's actually a more practical uh, usage of their potential nuclear power, their, their support for uh, radical groups conducting uh, lower levels of uh, military attacks against uh, Israel uh, and, and, and uh, uh, in other conflicts uh, in the region uh, that will be amplified by Iran being able to you know, cover itself with a uh, uh, nuclear umbrella. And uh, I think uh, Israel uh, faces this, uh, uh, this existential issue and needs to do uh, everything it can, both rhetorically and uh, ultimately militarily, to try to prevent that. And the Prime Minister speaking to Congress, you think, advances that goal? Well, I, I hope it will. Yeah. You know, it, it depends... Uh, uh, how persuasive he is and uh, how the Congress reacts. But I, I do have the sense that there's a uh, very widespread unease with uh, where President Obama is going with this, and unease that includes a significant share uh, of Democrats. And the, uh, the, the stance that the administration is taking that it... Uh, does not want any agreement it reaches with Iran to be uh, submitted to for any kind of congressional approval, and the great uh, uh, secrecy with which the uh, the U.S. positions are developed, I think, are all uh, feeding that unease in Congress. So, uh, I suspect, although uh, you know, Obama will be even more uh, churlish toward Netanyahu than he's been for the last six years. Uh, after this appearance, that uh, it's likely to be uh, well and gratefully received by the, by the uh, most of the members. Look, uh, if you look at the pattern of the Israeli experience with the United States, uh, a few striking points emerge. In 1967, Lyndon Johnson warned Levi Eshkol not to strike preemptively. Israel struck preemptively, defying the American president, and the result was more American support for Israel, not less, both at the level of the administration and, and publicly. In 1973, Golda Meir made the disastrous mistake of succumbing to U.S. pressure not to strike preemptively, and the result was actually a great deal of pressure from the Nixon administration, uh, um, not, a, not, not gratitude. In 1981, Menachem Begin defied the Reagan administration by destroying the Osirak reactor. Support for Israel rose. In 1991, Yitzhak Shamir did what George H.W. Bush asked of him, which was not to respond militarily to the attacks, the Scud missile attacks from Iraq, and the result was 
the, the first Bush administration came down on Shamir like a ton of bricks. So there is an exam, there, there are, there, there's a good record that every time Israel defies the wishes of an American president, um, so long as it succeeds in the action it's taken, uh, it improves its position politically within the United States. More to the point, um, it's not a matter of admiration versus respect, it's love versus respect. Israel has been attempting to court the world's love since 1993 and the signing of the Oslo Accords. Uh, it, gave up, uh, it gave up Gaza, it, gave up, uh, it accepted the PA, it accepted Yasser Arafat, it marched out of southern Lebanon, it marched out of Ramallah, it marched out of Hebron, it, um, it, 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 made one, it took one risk and made one concession for peace after another. Now, I don't know anyone who has ever said, I'm pro-Israel because Israel is the country that takes risks for peace. I know a lot of people who say, I'm pro-Israel because that country has guts. And that country does what we don't have the guts to do. I think that what Israel needs to court is not the love of the West or of Barack Obama. It needs to court its respect. And by the way, what goes in international relations goes in personal relations as well. Marriages that are not founded on some basis of respect tend to fail. Um, uh, love is great, but respect is, is, is fundamental. I think that we should be mindful of that when we go into, uh, when we're thinking of uh, a BB speech. Remember, Bibi's supporters, okay, are not wavering Democrats who hate him anyway and are inclined to boycott the speech. It's the people like the Speaker of the House, Republicans and Democrats like Robert Menendez, who uh, appreciate the position that Israel's in and don't, and don't think that a prime minister addressing a co-equal branch of government is some sort of catastrophic affront to the dignity of, um, of the United States. This was a fight, incidentally, picked not by Netanyahu, it was picked by President Obama. The, I, the irony here, and I'll conclude with this, is that thank you, President Obama, because now Americans are gonna be riveted to a speech they would otherwise ignore. I, you know, uh, from the perspective of trying to achieve what he wanted to achieve, the president didn't, this didn't work out so well. I sometimes wonder whether there's actually some uh, secret Zionist uh, scheme in the White House. That's um, the live tweet part people are going to uh, send out. Brett that, Stevens that suggests said, secret uh, Zionist a, scheme. With a raised eyebrow. And visit to New York synagogue, yeah. Viral, right there. Um, so, I mean, you touched on that, though. I mean, that actually raises the question, why the hysteria from the punditry? I mean, the suggestions, you can think it's a good move for Israel, not a good move for Israel. But we've seen things, you know, suggest that this is unconstitutional. Uh, people who have, uh, even people who are usually not sympathetic to the Obama administration, Bob Kagan had a piece in the Washington Post comparing this to the Citizen Genet affair, where, you know, which, as I recall, involved the French ambassador actually trying to run a war out of the United States, um, so it seems a bit extreme. Is this, why is, is this touching some sort of sensitive chord? I mean, what is, why are people reacting with such hysteria to this, actually? Is there a suggestion for that? Well, first of all, this administration has always been hysterical when it comes to Israel and, 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 and the prime minister in a way that, as I suggested earlier, doesn't actually suit uh, uh, its long-term uh, goal. So, you know, to quote whoever it was, Talleyrand, it's worse than a crime, it's a mistake, at least from, uh, uh, from their point of view. The suggestion that it is somehow unconstitutional for the Speaker of the House to invite a foreign guest to speak to a co-equal branch of government suggests some uh, uh, not great familiarity with the Constitution. It's also, by the way, never mind constitutionality, it is un-American for people to boycott a speech on this subject from an Israeli, what, what, he's not throwing poisoned arrows, he's speaking. So sit there, agree with him or disagree. Every time Republicans sit for a State of the Union address, they sit on their hands, but they show up. Should they boycott, should we boycott State of the Union addresses when, when we don't like the, 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 the man, the party of the man who's in power? It's absurd. And, and lastly, I think the reason this has become so neuralgic is that the administration at some level is conscious of the sellout that this deal represents 
for the United States, for its promises to its allies, for its promises to Israel, and for its fidelity to our own long-term national security interests. So, so let's build now directly on that. Uh, what you touched on, Brett, was who the prime minister is speaking, to whom the prime minister is speaking, speaking to his supporters. Um, he'll be delivering it in this speech in response to an invitation from the Republican Speaker of the House. Um, the day before, and two days before, American Jews and American politicians will be converging in APAC, which is dedicated to keeping Israel's support for Israel a bipartisan issue. Now, um, Josh, you know, after you document how the left turned on Israel, you speak about this seeping into the mainstream in America, noting the uh, famous moment at the Democratic National Convention in uh, 2012, where they tried to reinsert Jerusalem back into the platform, uh, and it was booed um, in the audience. Um, you, Brett, as well, right, in your column on Netanyahu, you say that democratic support for Israel has been eroding for decades. Um, the Gallup poll that was out, you note the 2013 Gallup poll, 2014 Gallup poll just came out that notes uh, pro-Israel level for Republicans at 80%, uh, Democrats at 48, I think. Um, so we, I think we can all agree that having only one party that's unquestionably pro-Israel would be a lamentable state of affairs. But it seems to be happening, at least partially. So to what extent should Israel and its supporters accept the inevitability of Israel becoming more and more of a partisan issue? I don't think it should be uh, accepted, and uh, I, I think that will, that, that trend may uh, abate or even reverse somewhat under a diff different Democratic Party leadership than uh, uh, President Obama, who's so deeply unfriendly to Israel. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, it, it's going to be a, 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 a fact of life that uh, it is a fact of life that Republicans are uh, the party of rock solid support for Israel uh, today, and uh, Democrats are uh, more ambivalent, and uh, in particular, liberal Democrats are extremely uh, ambivalent. We saw that in uh, Pew polls this past summer during the war in Gaza, in which uh, uh, Democrats who identified themselves as liberals uh, were as likely to blame Israel as Hamas uh, uh, for the war. Uh, the, Israel and its supporters should not therefore abandon uh, or turn their backs on the Democratic Party, right. but neither should they do something that I think uh, is uh, uh, it, it, that I feel I see from various uh, Jewish organizations, which is uh, to uh, uh, respond to this by focusing their greatest energies on uh, reaffirming their own liberal credentials and saying uh, to the liberals who are deserting Israel, hey, we're, uh, we're with you and we're, we're all liberals and we have to be, you have to like Israel. Uh, and uh, at the same time, I think uh, having a kind of standoffish attitude often toward the... Uh, uh, conservatives who support Israel, and in particular uh, toward the what has now become the most important uh, base of support for Israel in the United States, and that is the evangelical uh, community. The polls show us now that evangelicals are uh, equally or slightly more supportive of Israel uh, uh, as Jews. Actually, yeah, and I'll throw in, I think one of the polls they had was they asked on a poll, in the Pew poll, do you believe that the land of Israel was given by God to, to the Jewish people? And uh, that was affirmed by evangelicals, uh, 80%, American Jews, 40%, uh, actually. So, uh, uh, and, well, yeah. and, but that's, that's, a, that's very dramatic. Yeah. But you could argue that that question is kind of sure. uh, pitched to an evangelical well, worldview. But when they ask simply about support for Israel, right. Uh, evangelicals and Jews uh, both come out at 75%, but, <laughs> but Jews have higher numbers on the other side right. than, than uh, evangelicals. And uh, yet there's uh, a, uh, 
a, a prevailing sense in the uh, Jewish world of uh, distrusting this and keeping it uh, at arm's length. There, there was, if I may get in one more word on this, Pew also did a, an amazing poll, or amazing to me in its results, this past spring, in which was not about the Middle East, but it asked, uh, it was what they call a thermometer poll, you know, warm versus cold feeling, toward various other religions, or towards various religions. And they gave respondents a list of 10 religions or religious groups, how do you feel about them? And Pew reported that the most popular group in America are Jews. Now this certainly is unprecedented in the entire history of the diaspora. Uh, uh, and, um, and then Pew went on to say the reason that Americans feel so friendly to Jews is because of the response of evangelical Protestants. And then Pew further added, comma, a feeling that was not reciprocated. And uh, I think it behooves us in the Jewish world to think about the fact that we have this amazing reservoir of support out there and we keep holding these people in contempt and how long can we expect them to go on supporting us if we take a completely standoffish attitude toward them? I think the important question isn't to ask what can supporters of Israel do to court um, liberals or Democrats. Um, the answer is nothing. You know, it's neither here nor there. The question that liberals should be asking is what has become of liberalism in Barack Obama's America that it is now turning on the only liberal democratic state in the Middle East? What has become of liberalism? You know, I remember years ago when I was editor of the Jerusalem Post uh, in the run-up to the uh, Iraq war, there was this huge protest in uh, London against uh, war in Iraq. And some photographer, some Reuters or AP photographer, caught a, one of the protesters holding a sign that said, Queers for Palestine. Uh, marvelous. Does this guy have any idea what happens to queers in Palestine? Uh, and that's, that's not a flippant question. Because you now have some significant segment of the political left fellow traveling with a movement that is largely dominated by Islamic radicals and fundamentalists who despise gays, despise women, despise religious minorities, despise freedom of speech, uh, despise uh, pluralism, despise everything that liberals are supposed to believe in. I mean, we have now on college campuses American liberals who would uh, probably not break bread with anyone who had supported, uh, what is it, Proposition 8 in, in California, banning uh, uh, gay marriage, but will happily break bread with Palestinians who have no problem with throwing gay people off the tops of high buildings. And, and I think, you know, I'm sorry, I, uh, I, I have social views which are liberal, otherwise I'm fairly conservative, but, uh, you know, it, it, I think liberals should be saying, what has become of us? You know, in the 1940s, after the Second World War, you know, there was a feeling among many Democrats that too much of the left was moving in the direction of being objectively a fellow traveler of the Soviet Union. Too many people were on the side of Henry Wallace. And some effort was made in the Democratic Party among liberals, Arthur Schlesinger, to, you know, lustrate, to, to, to weed these people out and say, they, they don't belong in our movement. And I keep waiting for a moment now among American Democrats to say, you know, something is, something deeply wrong, has, something deeply wrong is occurring here. And some grown-ups in the party have to stand up and say, if we are not a pro-Israel party, shame on us. Because it, it, it speaks to the hollowness of our values, to our inability to apply them universally. And I, I, I'm waiting for that to happen. I mean, I, I write for the Wall Street Journal. I can't do that. But, you know, Tom Friedman, these guys who have some purchase in the liberal world, stand up. So now that we actually have details leaking out of what's actually taking place with the Iran negotiations, 
let's try to actually predict what will happen next. Um, you've both made your views quite clear on what you think of the agreement. Uh, Josh, you've written before, um, even sanctions, even severe sanctions, you thought, would not work. You've written that only two methods have turned states away from nuclear weapons, military force and regime change. And Brett, in American Retreat, and this was some time before when you wrote the book, uh, you wrote that the chances that Israel will attempt to strike, even as the dangers of doing so have risen over time, have increased. And this is not a prospect the U.S. should relish, because if Iran's nuclear infrastructure is going to be attacked, it should be attacked comprehensively. And only America has the military assets to deliver a knockout blow. So, would both of you argue for an American strike in Iran? Do you think that's likely under any administration? And I'll add that, I mean, if you read Vice President Cheney's memoir, he talks about his own advocating for this as a minority of one in the Bush administration. So is that likely under any American administration? And given now the recent announced state of affairs, is an Israeli strike the most likely scenario? Well, uh, I, don't, I don't know what, whether uh, an Israeli strike is likely or not. I think that uh, uh, a, a, uh, a, the biggest question is, you know, will, it be, will there be time enough left when, uh, uh, when Obama leaves office uh, uh, for this to be even an option for a next administration? And uh, I, I think it's... Uh, Entirely possible that a uh, a new Republican administration uh, would, in fact, be willing to uh, do this. There are several. Uh, I don't. There, there are countless Republican uh, candidates. Uh, the the uh, and and I have no way of guessing who who might be president. But uh, there are any number of them who have taken very tough uh, positions. Uh, the and and we're much farther uh, uh, down the line than. We were in the Bush uh, years. If, a, uh, if, if Iran doesn't yet have a, uh, a nuclear bomb by the time, if there is a Republican administration, by the time a new administration comes in, uh, it would be able to, if it chose to do this, it would be able to say this was the very last possible resort after all these years of uh, negotiations, sanctions, and, and uh, Iran was just about to cross this threshold, and therefore we stopped it. I think that th that is uh, imaginable for a, a Republican administration. Brett, do you agree? I was bitterly disappointed that the Bush administration didn't act against Iran, and uh, um, uh, partly on account of the uh, dreadful 2007 national intelligence estimate, which falsely claimed that Iran had abandoned its nuclear weaponization, uh, falsely and misleadingly claimed that it abandoned its nuclear weaponization program. I don't see any prospect of this administration uh, using a military option in the, event of a fa in the event that these negotiations fail. Everything tells me that, um, you know, this administration means a nuclear Iran is unacceptable in the way that I tell my five-year-old daughter that her behavior is unacceptable. It's a completely meaningless, empty phrase. Um, Have you thought of sanctions, maybe? Yeah. I think, I think my five-year-old is pretty sure that I will not bomb her in the event yeah. that she... Uh, but do you uh, tell her that all uh, options are on the table? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mainly the cookies on one side and the ice cream on the other. Yeah. Um, it's more of a uh, carrot or ice cream than so, stick. So in the event, so because we don't have what ought to be the world's preeminent power taking care of the world's uh, leading security crisis, it is left dangerously to much smaller countries uh, to take much greater risks and act. But I've now concluded since writing that book uh, that Israel has to act. And it has to act whether or uh, even if it is in defiance of the United States. I mean, I, one thing I'm pretty confident about is that the, uh, President Obama will not send up F-18 fighters to oppose 
uh, Israel in the event that uh, Israel bombs uh, uh, Iran. Um, but you know, one, one point that I want to make that, that's somewhat to the side of this, but I think in a sense is, is, it informs this discussion. A lot of time is being spent uh, saying, well, when will Israel have the legitimacy to strike? Um, when will all the diplomatic options be so visibly exhausted that people will say, well, what else could they do? But the purpose of any strike is not to win some argument on the op-ed pages of the New York Times. Uh, it's not to prove, that, I mean, what more legitimacy does Israel need uh, in destroying a prospective nuclear arsenal from a country that constantly avers its desire uh, and demonstrates its desire to destroy it. I don't think that this whole legitimacy argument is, is, uh, is kind of uh, notional, and, and in fact, it's, it's dangerous. The question is, what does Israel do to assure its security in the face not only of Iran's nuclearization, but eventually the nuclearization of, 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 the, uh, of, the entire, uh, uh, of the entire Middle East? And I hope that Israeli leaders don't feel so crippled by the idea, well, we're going to be condemned. So let the world condemn you. Big deal. The world's been condemning Jews for an awfully long period of time. You know? And I don't think Israel came into being uh, to showcase Jewish victimhood. It came into being to end it. You know, so I hope they bear that in mind. Uh... And if that happens, then what happens next? I mean, I'll mention this in a minute, but you have this terrifying chapter where you try to predict... Right. What happens in the next couple years? Well, the chapter years. that I have is, is what happens when you don't do anything. Right. When, when diplomacy, quote, succeeds, right. and uh, Saudis are not particularly convinced that uh, Obama is the uh, diplomatic Metternich he seems to make himself out to be. Um, uh, um, uh, and uh, they then uh, uh, construct uh, or acquire, uh, acquire a, a nuclear capability. You know, people talk about all the unintended consequences. Let's say Israel strikes, all kinds of things that right. might happen. And some of those are quite serious, although I tend to think that they're often exaggerated. So long as Israel is the nuclear power and Iran is not, Israel retains uh, the ultimate strategic checkmate. It's playing with a queen against an opponent that doesn't have... Um, uh, that doesn't have a queen. But the question that behooves us to ask isn't what the unintended consequences of an Israeli strike might be. It's what the very foreseeable consequences of allowing Iran to acquire nuclear capability or a nuclear arsenal will be. And by the way, it's not just that Iran might use its nuclear weapons. When it comes to nuclear weapons, possession is use. An Iran that has a nuke has strategic options that it does not have now with Hezbollah in Syria, in the Persian Gulf, now in Yemen, it can threaten in ways, incredible ways, that, that it doesn't have now. Look, what's, what's North Korea? North Korea is a nothing country. It's probably poorer than most countries in Africa. And yet its possession of an arsenal of 10, 15 nuclear weapons makes it a serious strategic concern around, around the world. If Turkmenistan tomorrow got nuclear weapons, we'd all become experts in Turkmenistan, right? Actually, the Turkmen's are all right. But um, uh, this, this, is, this, this is what we should be worried about, not you know, uh, ideas, well, everything has unintended consequences. When we invaded Grenada, it had unintended consequences. So what? Uh, did you want that, Sanjay? No. no. The problem is really much worse than North Korea, because North Korea has more or less no way to, uh, to, to uh, make use of its nuclear threat as a cover for other kinds of activity, whereas, as you uh, mentioned a moment ago, Brett, the, the uh, real Iranian game is, is, not to, is probably not to just unleash a nuclear bomb on Israel or anyone else, but to use the nuclear threat to very much ramp up what it's been doing for years, which is to try to use all kinds of uh, conventional military power to become the dominant uh, a country in the in the region, and uh, and and it's made great strides uh, in that direction. And when it uh, uh, if it gets uh, this uh, uh, nuclear cover for its aggressive activities, 
some of the others in the region will uh, react uh, by uh, trying to get nuclear weapons of their own, but uh, there are others who will react by accommodating and appeasing. And uh, it will be another giant step forward in, mm -hmm. in Iran's uh, uh, b uh, big plan to become the dominant player in that part of the world. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about a few uh, of the challenges facing Israel now. Um, Josh, your book comprehensively describes the systematic attempt and the great success in much of the world to delegitimize Israel morally, to turn Israel into an aggressor and to a Goliath. You chart the process over the last 40 years. If you combine that with that chapter in your book, Brett, where you describe the future in a land of where as you put it, diplomacy succeeds. Um, you have a scene taking place in maybe 2018 or something like that. You couldn't have had the Cubs winning the World Series in there too, as long as you're predicting the future? Hopefully no, no. <laughs> hopefully not. You only do plausible predictions. Um, uh, so there you, you, have a, you have a scene where you, tens of thousands of Israeli Arabs walk into Talbia and other parts of Jerusalem holding keys to apartments that once were theirs, and you say, oh, that once were there, there so, or the, they so they claim, right, okay. Um, once, uh, um, and then you say, you write as follows, uh, that Palestinians realize in the scenario that they could never hope to prevail against Israel through violent means. Palestinian leaders sought instead to win through fierce moral pressure. The Palestinians had at last figured out how to apply maximum pressure on Israel's Achilles heel, its susceptibility to moral reproach. So, do you, do you actually see this as the next great challenge to Israel? Uh, is this a, a, a serious prediction? And to, to both of you, what moral and philosophical attacks will be leveled against Israel in the future, and in what way will they differ from previous ones? I mean, uh, fortunately, uh, Israel has been well served by the stupidity of its enemy uh, in, in the Palestinians in that uh, a Palestinian leader who had uh, uh, used uh, nonviolence uh, in 1993 would have long ago achieved a state. Of course, the Palestinian aim isn't to achieve a state, it's to destroy Israel. And so that's why they have not taken to nonviolence because the last thing a Palestinian leader wants is to be the president of some small 23rd Arab uh, uh, corrupt and, and uh, um, insignificant Arab Republic. People like Arafat see themselves as the next Saladin, as the liberators of, uh, of, of, uh, of Jerusalem. But this is a very serious problem that I think Jews in particular face. That's what I talked about, the susceptibility to moral reproach. This habit that we Jews have uh, constantly to ask ourselves, well, what have we done wrong to explain why they want to kill us? We do it all the time. Uh, and we find, be, we, we apply Jewish genius to condemn ourselves. Um, or to serve, in effect, as the lawyers for the opposition. Not just the Richard Fox of the world, who really are the lawyers for the opposition, but to, to create pretexts and to create alibis. Look, I wish nothing more than a scenario where it turned out that settlements really were the core of the conflict. Terrific. If settlements are the core of the conflict, get out of the settlements, the conflict ends, the Palestinian Authority or a Palestinian state becomes Canada, you visit whenever you want, you know, you, you get to smoke Cuban cigars, I guess now that makes no difference anyway, um, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and that's, uh, that's terrific. But what we've learned, what we should have always known, but certainly what we've learned since the withdrawal from Gaza is that settlements are not the core of the conflict, the conflict is not territorial, it's existential. And we constantly fall into this trap of agreeing to so many of the premises which are uh, not only false but uh, dishonest of Palestinians and their uh, fellow travelers that this is somehow a conflict that was generated by Israeli aggression. And that is simply wrong. Um, and it has to be rebutted and rebutted uh, aggressively. I mean, I guess constitutionally I enjoy being unpopular. Um, and, and so I don't mind saying this stuff, but there is this kind of uh, sickness, if you will, 
and maybe it's universal or maybe it's simply Jewish, of this, of this desire to be loved. Now, I can't stand it when I go to pro-Israel events and people say, oh, you know, we're, we're, um, we're reconstructing Haiti. You know, terrific, you're reconstructing Haiti. That's great. As if, as if that is supposed to be what justifies Israel. Israel cannot be justified ultimately on, a, uh, on account of its moral performance because every now and then Israel will not perform as well as it ought. And so when you expect everything of a country, you wind up forgiving uh, nothing of it. And we can't, we can't risk that. With the Iranians, it's the opposite, or the Palestinians, it's the opposite. We expect nothing of the Palestinians, so we forgive them everything. Israel is not justified by its moral performance. Israel is justified by the fact that it's a state that can reasonably assure the security of Jewish people and the flourishing of Jewish civilization. And that's it. And we should stop saying, well, we have to perform according to some standard. We have to take Eric Hoffer's wise words into our head. Israel cannot be the only country in the world that is expected to behave like a Christian nation. I, I think you also asked uh, what what uh, new, uh, right. what lines, new yeah. lines of attack to uh, uh, to to uh, uh, impeach Israel's standing we can expect, and uh, uh, surely there will be some that will uh, rise out of uh, uh, Israel's uh, new status as an energy exporter. This will reinforce the image of Israel as a uh, uh, plutocratic capitalist, uh, etc., and uh, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, there's a new line of attack that arises out of Israel's de facto uh, alliance with Saudi Arabia uh, now, and and uh, some of the uh, uh, same people who are uh, completely, uh, uh, as uh, Brett pointed out, completely reticent about how uh, Palestinians treat. Uh, women or gays will no doubt be taxing Israel for having friendly relations with Saudi Arabia because of how Saudi Arabia uh, treats them. But uh, I, I think the, the uh, probably the, the most uh, uh, difficult new line of uh, attack on Israel that we can anticipate uh, is likely to grow out of the Iran situation, assuming that uh, uh, there is not a... Uh, uh, a, a successful uh, a rearrangement of relations between the United States, uh, with the rapprochement with Iran that uh, President Obama is uh, so single-mindedly seeking. And uh, there's uh, uh, some new round of uh, tension, anger, hostility. Uh, then I think that there will be a rush led by President Obama uh, to blame Israel for uh, the uh, failure, uh, that, uh, and, and we'll get stories about how, like this story of the, uh, from years ago, of the Swiss diplomat who allegedly carried the message from Tehran that they wanted to uh, resolve all issues and reconcile with uh, uh, the United States. Uh, a, a, you know, an absurd story, because if that was the Iranian government's aim or policy, it had many ways to let us know uh, that and and uh, but there will be a, a rash of stories about how uh, the Obama was on the cusp of success of a rapprochement uh, with Iran and uh, Israel Israel ruined, ruined the deal. Ruined I actually noticed this is actually this just was on the on the news that it, the an Israeli satirical website, the Israeli version of the Onion, published a fake story that uh, Netanyahu had unfriended Obama on his Facebook page, and Iran has just now broadcast this all over the news, uh, announcing this uh, as an actual story, actually quoting this uh, satirical website. So it's begun already. Uh, there you have it. Brett, did you want to add something on this? No? Yeah. Look, I mean, the avenues of attack are almost infinite. Uh, one of the things that amused me coming from the editorial pages of uh, our... Um, uh, a major New York metropolitan newspaper that is not the Wall Street Journal. Um, 
uh, was, a, was an op-ed after Israeli started pointing out how gay-friendly Israel is, how it's the one country in the Middle East uh, where you can, um, where, where uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it supports gay rights and so forth and so on. Um, some professor uh, in, in New York said, well, this is a case of pinkwashing that Israel was guilty of pinkwashing, that Israel was trying to hide the uh, indignity and evil of the occupation behind uh, its support for gay rights. So, I mean, the cre creativity when it comes to hating Jews is, is profound, and we know this. I mean, we talk about anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is a 19th century term for old-fashioned religious Jew hatred transmogrified into racial hatred, which was later transmogrified into uh, hatred of Jews for being international, which later became hatred of Jews for being national. Now it's hatred of Jews for pinkwashing. Later it's gonna be hatred of Jews for, uh, um, for over-representation in Nobel Prizes, which is clearly, you know, I mean, it's always going to be something. And I think, you know, excuse me for thinking as a columnist, but uh, I, I think in terms of phrases, I think, um, you know, from time to time, the Israeli flag has to be raised from uh, the Star of David has to be raised from the flagpole of a middle finger, of a raised middle finger. And I, you know, and I guess this is what I'm saying, you know, we're unpopular, what's new? You know, what's new? And let's stop, let's stop panting after the world's approval. Aristotle, good philosopher, tells us that um, beneficiaries hate their benefactors. So let's stop going on about what great benefactors we've been in the world, Jonas Salk and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so we've been benefactors, that's great, that's marvelous. But that's not what, we're, what we should be about. And I can't stand this effort. Someone came up to me and said, don't you think that if BB doesn't speak, then the administration will somewhat modify its hatred? And I remember looking at this guy and thinking, oh my God, we're lost. But fortunately, we're not. Yeah. I didn't see that story about pink washing. I read the New York Post pretty regularly, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, predictions for the coming election season here in this country. Um, y you've had your own, Josh, very interesting political journey, which you've written about. Um, you and your prediction chapter, Brett, describe the uh, Hillary Clinton Rand Paul uh, election of 2016. Um, are we going to actually have a debate in the Republican Party between neo isolationism uh, or Taft Republicanism and what the Republican Party has been since Reagan? Is that actually going to happen? or? all the discussion about that is, is overblown. I don't think we're gonna have a debate about it. I think it's, I mean, I'm completely surprised by it. But even, even Rand Paul has, uh, uh, who I don't believe will be nominated. In fact, I don't believe he'll be nominated for this very reason, because his own brand of snake oil isn't selling. Yeah. And so he himself uh, has backed off of uh, past isolationist positions and past uh, anti-Israel positions. The, uh, uh, the, the, the remarkable news is how the, uh, all of the Republican candidates are uh, uh, competing with each other to uh, demonstrate who is the most uh, pro-Israel. I, I flew up from Washington and the, the whole front page of the Washington Post this morning is uh, devoted to Mike Huckabee and his... Uh, uh, and his practice, uh, this organization he has, uh, in which he leads groups of Christians to see uh, Israel many times a year. He takes these, he runs these tours. All he needs is a Pesach program. He'll be all set. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and and then uh, Ted Cruz, who is presumably the leading candidate from the Tea Party wing, which is presumably the part of the Republican Party that's most uh, attuned to isolationist sentiment as uh, also at pains to demonstrate that he's a uh, uh, fiercely 
pro-Israel uh, 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 person, and uh, and uh, uh, I, I think uh, I would I wouldn't have predicted it, but I think uh, for whatever reasons the, the center uh, the, the the Tea Party has really taken its lumps in the last election, and the uh, the center of gravity in the Republican Party is not isolationist at this point. It's it's firmly, I think, in the internationalist and pro-Israel camp. Well, I wrote my book in part because I feared uh, that um, the isolationist strain was uh, re-emerging not only among so-called progressive liberals, but also uh, a big segment of the Republican uh, Party, or at least the Republican electorate. And it's been interesting when I've, uh, on my book tour, uh, say doing call-in radio shows and fly over country America, how many people who call in and they'll say, well, first of all, I hate Obama, that socialist, Muslim, blah, blah, you know, kind of stereotypical. And then they'll proceed to say, but we should not be supporting foreign wars, we're bankrupt. Um, and so the, we need a pedagogy for explaining why the use of American power and why American credibility and why America continuing to fulfill a role as world's policeman is not simply an act of altruism for other countries, but ultimately uh, a matter of enlightened self-interest. And you know, it's an interesting experience to be on these call-in shows because you have to think, okay, never mind how am I going to convince, you know, uh, I don't know, Norman Podhoritz. I mean, he already agrees with me anyway, right? Um, but how am I going to convince that caller? And uh, uh, not long ago, I had, a, uh, I had this experience, and I said to this caller, I said, um, do you have a Samsung phone in your pocket by any chance? And he said, yeah. I said, interesting. Where is Samsung from? He said, I don't know. I said, it's from South Korea. I said, ask yourself what it took to put a Samsung phone in your pocket. It took tens of thousands of Americans dead in the Korean War. It took hundreds of thousands of American troops policing the demilitarized zone for over 60 years. It took uh, long-term political commitments, which involved the slow movement from authoritarianism to democracy in South Korea. It took an economic relationship, an immigration relationship that brought millions of Korean immigrants to this country, a free trade agreement. And here we have in South Korea a first world technological powerhouse, a ma major trading partner whose phones you use and perhaps you also drive their cars if you happen to have a Hyundai. So it's a reminder that America cannot think of the rest of the world as somehow being out there. And Americans cannot imagine that if we just make ourselves inconspicuous by withdrawing from place after place, that we will be left alone. We'll be like New Zealand, just quiet and out of the way. That's not what we're going to be. As I said, you know, you quoted this at the beginning, we will be the preeminent power of the 21st century, and so we have to not treat foreign policy as a spectator, uh, as a spectator sport. And what I hope whoever the next president is gonna be is veer us off what I consider a radical foreign policy course undertaken by this administration and back to the John F. Kennedy, Ronald Reagan centrism of the 20th century, which in many respects fundamentally steered us right. Now that's, that's the, the, per, the point of the book isn't to really offer some new theory, although it does and rather brilliantly and eloquently and, and with all kinds of racy passages that, I, that you have to read deep into the book to get. Um, but, but more to the point, it's to, be a remi it's to remind Americans that the world that we created after the Second World War hasn't only been good for the world, it's been good for us. Um, and if we can do that, I mean, I'm happy to say I know a number of the GOP uh, prospective candidates who have read the book, but you know, if they take my advice, all will be well. <laughs> Final question. Uh, both of your books are about the uh, true challenges facing those who favor an America that projects strength, as well as the challenges facing those who care about Israel and its future. So since we are about to celebrate, as I mentioned at the beginning, Purim, celebrating the salvation of the Jewish people, the triumph of good over evil. So as we conclude this, as you both call, as you call it, a depressing topic, 
What encourages you today, both relating to the future of the U.S. and Israel? Well, uh, the, 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 there, there are two things that are encouraging and that we shouldn't uh, lose sight of uh, even amidst our, uh, I think, well-based fears and worries, which is the, the simply spectacular success story that Israel itself is. Uh, Israel was one of scores of new nations that were created uh, in the aftermath of World War II. And the, uh, uh, the, the sad story is that the, the, the predominant outcome is that most of those uh, new nations have been failures or have uh, struggled. And uh, amidst the scores, there is uh, one that stands out just uh, remarkably above all others uh, for its uh, success really on, on every level of human achievement. I mean, both for the military strength that has enabled it to survive and also for the uh, 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 spectacular growth of its economy and its achievement of uh, first world uh, stature uh, for uh, provide a society uh, that is still made up uh, in many times larger proportion of immigrants who have to go through a whole readjustment than any other country. And yet uh, the, the uh, UN does something called the, uh, the, the Human Development Index, of, of which it rank, ranks every country in the world each year. And uh, uh, this is one UN thing that's just a matter of crunching numbers, so it can't be twisted against Israel like almost everything else that's, that comes out of the UN. And uh, Israel last year uh, ranked 15th in the whole world, ahead of most of Western Europe in terms of uh, the, the things that go into this index in, in, in uh, health, education, uh, and, uh, and uh, things of that sort. So it's really... Uh, you know, arguably the greatest success story in the world uh, of the last uh, half century. And that's something uh, that we should take a tremendous amount of satisfaction in and, and, and also some confidence from about Israel's ability uh, to continue dealing with very difficult problems. And the, the other thing that I think is a point of optimism is what uh, I, I was uh, alluding to before, which is uh, I, uh, I share Brett's worries, and I've actually, over the decades, uh, s spilled many uh, words on uh, my uh, worries about the uh, recrudescence of isolationism in the United States. And I, uh, I think those worries have, to a very great extent, proved unfounded. Even today, today we say there's uh, the polls that show us that uh, there's a lot of isolationist sentiment in the country, uh, but there's always going to be isolationist sentiment in the country when there's an isolationist president, because uh, the, the American public hires a president to, uh, above all, uh, to lead us in the world and to tell us what we need to do in the world. And when we have a president who tells us what we need to do in the world is to uh, apologize and stop bothering other people and and uh, to uh, and and Brett in his book very nicely I thought picked up on uh, Obama's phrase nation building at home if that's what's coming from the president uh, you're simply never going to get the American people saying well Mr. President you're wrong we need to have a more active foreign policy but what we've seen in this uh, run-up the tour of 2016 is, on the one hand, uh, Hillary Clinton uh, uh, marking out ground for herself that's more internationalist and, uh, and uh, critical of Obama's direction. And as I said before, really the whole uh, panoply of Republican uh, candidates doing that. So I, I think that with a different president who, who delivered a different message uh, to the American people about uh, the things we need to do. And, and, and uh, there's plenty of evidence 
uh, out there from Iran's nuclear program to ISIS to the new to the, uh, 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 these threats to bomb uh, malls in the United States uh, uh, and so on to uh, enable uh, Americans to uh, uh, get the message that Brett talks about teaching them. So I think these, uh, uh, th there's, if we get some breaks in the electoral process, uh, there's uh, uh, plenty of room for hope. Um, so what gives me hope? Um, the 22nd Amendment of the Constitution. Someone gets that. Um, uh, uh, um, no, uh, look, a few points. Um, uh, one of the differences between uh, U.S. politics and Israeli politics is that in American politics, the margin for political BS, and I'm not referring to my initials, is enormous. Uh, I mean, you know, people say, I'm the candidate who's for the environment. I have yet to meet a person in my life who is against the environment, and yet people get away with this. In Israel, the margin for BS is very narrow. And so whoever wins the next election in Israel is going to be seized immediately with the realities Israel con confronts tactically and strategically from uh, its immediate neighborhood from Iran. Uh, um, you know, the, the likely, if, if the Zionist Union, the, the Bougie Herzog, Sipi Livni party wins, the likely next defense minister of Israel would be Amos Yadlin, who's a serious guy. So it's, it's uh, whoever takes power in Israel uh, can't, uh, just doesn't have the room to, to mess around. A second thing which gives me a sense of optimism is that even as we focus on um, rising anti-Semitism, BDS on campuses that we happen to send our children to, foolishly. Um, uh, there is tremendous philo-Semitism around the world, and it is largely untapped. Uh, Josh mentioned the evangelical community, but there's enormous philo-Semitism throughout East Asia, among the Chinese, in India, and we do relatively little to exploit that natural reservoir of admiration and, uh, uh, and respect. The third point is, you know, you mentioned that Israel is ranked 15th in the Human Development uh, uh, Index. Well, that means there's room to improve. I think it's outrageous that Israel's only, uh, only listed as the 15th country. I mean, Israel should be doing better. Uh, I was recently go over, going over some statistics, and I found that Israel, despite its reputation as startup nation, only has about $75 billion in accumulated foreign direct investment. But Singapore has $750 billion. Uh, it's absolutely unacceptable that the Jewish state should have less foreign direct investment than Singapore. But it means that actually we can do a lot better. Um, that Israel is not, uh, uh, is not tapped out. And we should be mindful of that. We should be like, you know, the proverbial Jewish mother scolding her child for the, for the A minus here. Um, that's how you ended up becoming a doctor. Um, and uh, I think the last point, and I think this is fundamental, is, is this. In the contest between democracies and dictatorships, uh, it's natural that democracies focus on their faults and dictatorships tend to hide their faults. Dictatorships advertise their strengths. And so democracies are often surprised by their own success. We were stunned by our victory in the Cold War. Why? Because we were busy obsessing about everything we were doing wrong uh, while the Soviet Union was having its you know, May Day parades with nuclear missiles you know, rumbling through, uh, rumbling through uh, Moscow. Uh, through the Kremlin, and lo and behold, it, it turned out that the dictatorial method of hiding its weaknesses made the regime, on the one hand, fierce and formidable, but on the other hand, very brittle. Whereas democracies, constantly self-correcting, um, going through periods of recession and growth, um, turned out uh, to be quite resilient, uh, to be much stronger and, and better founded than the dictatorships. And I think that's also ultimately true of Israel's confrontation with its enemies. Iran is not 10 feet tall. 
Iran is not 10 feet tall. And Israel will find that as fearsome as these enemies are, and as, as, we, should, as we should worry about them, the, the Israeli strengths will ultimately, ultimately defeat um, its enemies. The, the issue is not the outcome. The outcome is certain. The question is the price. On that note, please join me in thanking our guests for an extraordinary evening. We wish you all a Purim Sameach. Thank you all.